this week on the Back Table Podcast. I think that it actually is understood like fairly well. I did this research like over a decade ago and worked with all these really brilliant people who were like, oh yeah, this is the thing. Like it's a pretty well known mechanism of like visceral hyperalgesia and, and crosstalk. Like there are lots of, there's a few different mechanisms for it, but it's like a pretty well established thing. I think it's just that no one knows how to reverse it. Like once the horse has left the barn, like, how do you downregulate these mast cells? How do you downregulate all these pain receptors that have suddenly come to the surface? Like, how do you reverse central sensitization? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table OBGYN podcast, your source for all things obstetrics and gynecology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on backtable.com. All right, and welcome back to another episode of Backtable OBGYN. I've got my partner here, Dr. Amy Park. Amy, how are you? Great. How are you? Good. Clinic, OR, what'd you have today? I had some a mix of admin and meetings and things like that. So it was good. I feel like I in I'm, I go into my meeting days like excited that it's something different, and by the end, I'm like, I gotta go back to clinical stuff. But some meetings are better than others. We have another great guest, friend of ours, and social media star as well. We have Dr. Jocelyn Fitzgerald. Jocelyn, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Well, good. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. So Jocelyn is your gynecologist at McGee Women's Hospital in Pittsburgh. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences in the Division of Urogyne. So we want to talk today about interstitial cystitis, painful bladder syndrome. It's a topic that a lot of us, I think, would love to know more about. I know I do. So as we do in most episodes, we want our listeners to get to know who our guests are. So before we get into the meat of it all, though, tell us a little bit about yourself, your career, how you got to be doing what you're doing. Well, first of all, thank you both for having me. You're two of my favorite people, and I love this podcast, so I'm very excited to be here. So I work at McGee Women's Hospital, where I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I guess that's where it all started. Um, I'm the oldest of eight kids, so my mom and dad spent a lot of time at McGee when I was a kid, so I was in and out of there all the time. And I think that probably is where my honestly interest in women's health kind of started, was going in and out of that hospital so many times as a child to visit my mom postpartum. So that kind of stuck with me. And my parents are both very like community involved and like politically active people. And I remember talking about women's health just a lot around the dinner table. My mom is also the oldest in her family of seven, seven girls. I have six aunts. So there's just like women's health was kind of always a topic of discussion, but it wasn't always like a very I don't know, not intelligent because everyone in my family is very intelligent, but there was a lot of missing information in what was being discussed. So that was very interesting to me. I also kind of grew up in a very, I would say, progressive environment. So reproductive rights were also something that was talked about all the time. And it made me very interested in OBGYN. And so when I went to college, I went to Penn State and I was in the honors program where you have to write a thesis. And I double majored in neurobiology and women's studies. And Penn State is a big enough school that they actually had a Bachelor of Science in women's studies. So I took lots of women's health classes. And my thesis advisor was a woman named Phyllis Mansfield. She was a menopause scholar. She was like a population health researcher in menopause. And she had dual appointment in the Department of Biobehavioral Health and also women's studies. So I wrote my thesis on the backlash of the Women's Health Initiative working with her, which I think is probably pretty unusual in like 2008 that a college kid would be interested in menopause. But that intersection between my women's health classes that were taught with this sort of feminist scholarship perspective and my neurobiology classes gave me kind of a lot of perspective into particularly I got very interested in pain and in women's pain in, in specifically and how women's pain. I mean, I knew even in college as I was writing this thesis that women's pain, women's discomfort was not really taken seriously. I didn't have as much terminology for it then, but now people sort of will call it like medical gaslighting, women's symptoms sort of not being believed. So that was kind of like the crux of my my college thesis and what I got really interested in. 
And I knew from having great mentorship there that I was interested in OBGYN. And I was also interested in basic science. So it was like, how does one become a basic scientist and a feminist, I guess, at the same time? So then I went back to Pitt um, for med school and I was in the PSTP program, which is the physician scientist training program. It's like a one extra year of med school where you work in a basic science lab. It's to, you know, kind of keep MDs engaged in basic science without having to do a full PhD. And I worked in a lab, and this is where I think I'll probably spend a lot of time talking about today, in a, a lab with a mentor whose name's Chet de Grote. If you're ever reading any Eurogyne textbook, like the first couple of chapters where they talk about basically the autonomic control of the bladder, he pretty much discovered all of that. He was in his 80s when I was in his lab. And I worked with him and actually a gastroenterologist on a basic science project using rats where we looked at cross-sensitization between visceral, hollow pelvic organs and how that upregulates all of this neurogenic inflammation, things like endometriosis, IC, and like IBS and like kind of how those three things work together. And anyway, from there, I guess I'll just quickly wrap up and say that like that was sort of where my interest in pain came from. And then they tried really hard to get me to go into urology, but I didn't. I was just not that interested in men's health. I was very interested in women's health. So I chose to go into Eurogyne from the GYN side and then went to Hopkins for residency and then Georgetown Med Star for fellowship where Dr. Park was my attending. And that was a really interesting place to train too. And I'll pick up on this again, I'm sure at some point. But as Dr. Park knows, when I was there the, and still is, the MIGS division and the Eurogyne division are under one umbrella. So I was constantly in endometriosis cases, seeing chronic pelvic pain patients. All at the same time, I was learning about pelvic floor anatomy and, and urogynecologic surgery, which is kind of really where my clinical time is now still spent, like at the edge of MIGS and, and urogyne and IC. So you still call her Dr. Park? No, no. She called, I, I switched <laughs> to Dr. Park when I came to Cleveland Clinic. I was Amy at That's the time, true. like we're we're pre we're pretty cash in, <laughs> in my old job, and here it's definitely more formal. But I'm so proud of Jocelyn and all that she's done. And I just want to point out a couple things. First of all, congratulations on your McGee Women's Research Award. Oh, thank you for being an advocate. And I know you're super active. I also want to say that she downplays the role her family plays in Pittsburgh. Her dad is the ultimate Yinzer. He's the Allegheny County executive, Rich Fitzgerald. He's the Pittsburgh dad. Yeah. And she's definitely well connected <laughs> in Pittsburgh politics. And yeah, it's a lot of kids. So <laughs> everyone <laughs> knows to... us. I can't go yeah. anywhere. Yeah. I love the saying that that Jocelyn's mom would always tell them, like, I gave you life and I could take it away. My parents ran a very tight ship with the eight of us in a good way, my brothers and sisters, that's a whole other podcast, are so successful and so interesting. I learned so much from them. I do want to just pick up on that, what you said about MIGS and Eurogyne. I, we have always been, we are the yin and the yang, two opposite sides of the same coin of benign gynecology. Like we're better together. We're, we're natural allies. There's no space between us. In my old job, we took it was great. One in seven call. Additionally, like there's just a lot of overlap and it was just hand in glove. Like there's no static. And here at the clinic also, we have a very symbiotic relationship. So I think it's it's super important. I do think it's hilarious because I personally didn't do a lot of pelvic pain, but the fact that you were exposed to that in Vadim and Jim's club, J Vadim uh, more often, Jim Robinson's clinic is fascinating. And I know you've carried that collaborative spirit forward in your clinic with Nicole Donellan. Yeah. And I did a lot of IC chronic pelvic pain research at Hopkins with Tola Fashkin. I did like a randomized control trial with her on IC and pelvic pain. And you're right that at MedStar, the Eurogynes didn't see a ton of it, but I always knew I wanted that to be a part of my practice. And I just got such good training in endometriosis with the MIGS people at Hopkins and the MIGS people at Georgetown MedStar that it's just like, it's really, I think, given me this very unique perspective on how to approach interstitial cystitis painful bladder syndrome. That plus my basic science background in that disease, I really do think like, I am trying very hard to create like a paradigm shift. And I use social media a lot for how people think about IC painful bladder syndrome. I really, really, truly believe like in my heart of hearts that 
especially in young reproductive age women and probably a little bit postmenopausal women. That's a little bit of a discussion for another day. But like when you have that like, quote, recurrent UTI patient with negative cultures, I see sort of symptoms, all this other pelvic pain. They're usually in their 20s, usually have seen a bajillion doctors by the time they get to you. I'd say 85% of those patients have endometriosis. And that's really like the root of their bladder pain is neurogenic inflammation that is sensitizing their bladder afferents. And that's what all the basic science shows is often the pathophysiology of that. And I go to the OR with Nicole Donnellan, with Sarah Allen, with Sukhatu Mansuria, like, and I, I do cystos on these people at the same time. I'm doing pelvic floor injections. I go to the OR with them and wait and see for the, this these people's pelvis, and they all have end all. And these are patients that came to see me first as a urogyne for urinary symptoms, and in the end, what they have is endometriosis. And there's just like a lot of research I think still to be done. That's interesting that you say about 85 percent because I I actually didn't think that or know that because I'm always like looking for an infectious etiology and I try and think of like I mean obviously urine culture is low-hanging fruit but I also look at urethritis like gonorrhea and chlamydia and HSV and then urea plasma and mycoplasma I definitely check the most urea plasma mycoplasma my whole group in DC and like the people that it helped and I don't think there's good research on this but it helps younger patients who have a relatively recent onset of symptoms and have dysuria, the, if you find it in in the older patients who've had it for years, I don't think it really helps them as much. But um, How do you test for that? Is that a specific test? Yeah, you have to send it. It's a special send out. Well, I was doing it just similar to you when I came to McGee. And then shortly after I started, Lenore Ackerman, who's great and is giving a talk on ICD AUGS this year, she's urology FPMRS, I believe is her training on it. Don't quote me on that. Gave us a talk on microbiome and mycoplasma, urea plasma. And I can't quote exactly what it was, the data she presented to us, but basically convinced me to stop sending mycoplasma, urea plasma all the time because she made it seem like it was not that helpful of a practice. I'm curious to see what she says at her talk on IC at AUGS this year. I was just looking at the program today. I don't send as much of that as I used to, but maybe I should. Well, I mean, if you weren't finding much of it, then I don't think it, it and I and my practice changed once I came to Cleveland, but there's definitely like a very like a very specific subset of patients. The reason why I bring up the infectious etiology is that I do think there's absolutely endometriosis as a as an etiologic agent, but then I always wonder about the microbiome viral or bacterial activation just like HPV and chronic inflammation or some sort of reflex sympathetic we talked about that with uh, Ian on the uh, microbiome episode because he was talking about the urinary microbiome. And I said, what about the reproductive microbiome? And he, said, he was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, it's all connected. Like, why wouldn't there be one? Why would, like, there's bacteria that goes up into the, through the cervix of the uterus and the fallopian tubes, it's patent. We know that because, you know, people are made. So like, why wouldn't there be some and he was just like, oh, and then I started reading about it after our show we did. And there's, and I wasn't the first person to think about it, but there were some people are looking at it. Now there's some very, very, very early data to suggest there may be an infectious etiology, which we'll talk about endo another day. But to me, it just did not make sense. You know, it didn't, it did, none of the theories made any sense. It didn't, you know, oh, it's just retrograde menstruation. Well, that's not, it doesn't make sense. But yeah, no, I think like, and that was the other thing is between IC and endometriosis and IBS, we, I think they called him the three-headed monster when we were in fellowship because at Michigan, we did tons of pain. You know, Susie Asani is doing really advanced stuff, like way, way above my head. Most of what she does is, is way above my head. But yeah, I'm a, lot of the, a lot of this neurogenic stuff, you know, really thinking about pain in ways that I don't think any of us, most of us don't really have any idea about. So that's why it's exciting to have you on to teach us a little bit more about this. Well, there's a lot that I don't know, but I think to Dr. Park's point, and I'm calling her Dr. Park because we're on a podcast and people are listening and I... No, you can call me Amy. It's fine. It's 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 casual. Well, one of the things about this show, though, is that this is a physician-facing show, so we're all trying to talk in a way that if we were all sitting around chatting. And, and so, yes, I agree with you, though. I hear what you're saying, but... Yes, I don't want to untitle Dr. Park, but yes, she trained me. It's fine. I'm... 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 Uh... I am Knuff. She is Knuff. <laughs> <laughs> what a great movie. Oh, my God. But to Amy's point, you know, painful bladder syndrome, there's so many different phenotypes. And there's so many different, I think, probably like 
the two hit hypothesis that we talk about with cancer probably also applies to pain conditions. It's probably not just like one UTI. It's probably not just like a little bit of endo. It's probably a little bit of both, or it's probably a little bit of autoimmune, or it's probably a little bit of like like a trauma or probably a little bit of psych. Like I think most patients have all of these things that come together and create this perfect storm of neurogenic inflammation, other inflammation that hormonal things that sends off this real spectrum disorder of urinary symptoms that are not just bread and butter, like frequency urgency. It's this like really horrible visceral pain. I will admit that I think that I probably have a little bit of IC myself, which is another reason this is very interesting to me. Not terrible, but like I've always had like a very sensitive bladder. I absolutely like cannot drink diet drinks, like coffee very sparingly. I think viral things have a lot to do with it. I got some virus last winter and had truly what I thought was like an IC flare for months. It was awful. I have tried like almost every med that like I recommend to my patients. And it really is like a very different thing than being like, oh, I have to pee all the time. It's this like total horrible feeling. I feel much better now, but I have a lot of empathy for my patients with this condition because I've had some flares in my life that feel a lot like what I think I see probably is. Wow, that's interesting. I I do think that you're right about the hormones, though, and like there's a lot of pathways will lead to overactive bladder or... You know, we have Palm Cohen to talk about how all the different pathways that cause heavy or bleeding or or painful bleeding. So we don't have a lot of, it's hard to try and treat. Yeah, the phenotype, like for OAB, it doesn't even make that much of a difference because like by the time we get there, we treat it the same. For a lot of the normal uterine bleeding, we kind of treat it the same too. I mean, yeah, if it's anovulatory, it's different than it's fibroids or polyp or something, but you know, I think that the icy painful bladder story still is has yet to be elucidated. I mean, I'm sure you saw a lot of a Susie in Susie's clinic, you know, this. Oh, yeah. I mean, tons. Right. And so and that was one of the bigger challenges is, you know, I think it was defined by urologists and they don't see it. I'm really on a crusade to have OGS put out some IC guidelines of their own. But there but there's no. But, you know, I've, I've been in places where, like, the Department of Urology sends a letter out to the entire hospital saying we are no longer seeing IC. I'm like, wait a, wait a second. You can't do that. You can't just say we're not seeing it anymore. You, you define the thing and you guys, you guys take care of bladders. But the idea that they're, and I've talked to chairs working, you know, billing, coding over the years, like, it's not profitable to be in clinic talking to patients about their bladders for a long time when they want you to be operating. And so it's absolutely how we value financially specific causes. And again, it's a whole other whole other episode. But yeah, it, it's something that for many reasons, I think whether you're a urologist or whether you're a urogyne or whether you're a gynecologist, it's not something many people spend a lot of time in training. So that's why it's exciting for us to have to have you here. But just at a very basic level, how do we define painful bladder syndrome? I see what's are we are we are we just using both terms all the time? Is one is it one or the other? Like what's the official name and how do we even I don't know. I look this up all the time. And this also on social media, people get very triggered by the way you describe it. I usually say I see slash painful bladder syndrome. So people know I'm talking about both. When, when I emailed you every time it was painful bladder syndrome slash I see because I didn't know. No, that is that's what most people say because no one can, no one knows what it is and no one knows how to define it. And, you know, the AUA does like give some formal criteria I'm going to embarrass myself, but I believe it's bothersome urinary symptoms lasting more than six weeks without other identifiable cause. It's kind of like IBS, right? It's it's like a diagnosis of exclusion. So we've ruled out other stuff. I guess we'll call it IC. Negative cultures, blood in your urine. You know, there's, there's so many other things that I guess you could rule out. Hunter's ulcers used to be part of the diagnosis now, not. Is that correct? Well, they still are. They still are, but cystoscopy is not like, you don't absolutely need to, You that's not how it's diagnosed. If someone is not getting better and you suspect they might have a Hunter ulcer, which is which is a very distinct phenotype of IC, that's probably the type of IC that is best understood is bladder-centric IC that you go into someone's bladder and they legitimately, I tell my patients, it's like, oh, look, it's like you have a canker sore in your bladder. Like this is what's causing your pain. And we know that those respond to fulguration 
or Kenalog or steroid injections, they tend to get better. Like 85% of them really do get better and they can stay that way for up to a year. Sometimes people need them to be repeated. When I find Hunter lesions, I'm excited. I'm like, oh, I can treat this. This is something I can do something about. So that is part of the diagnosis if that's what you have. But most I see is treated first and foremost with a symptom, you know, survey with listening to the patient and starting off with basic things like behavioral modifications and seeing if you have dietary triggers, screening them for, you know, making sure you, of course, have ruled out UTIs, some other like type of organic pathology like a diverticulum or pelvic floor spasm obviously ask screening them for sort of endometriosis like symptoms history of sexual trauma and then kind of going from there and the the AOA does have an algorithm it was updated in 2022 thank goodness because prior to that it hadn't been updated since 2015 and they kind of really had this very stepwise approach and I see really responds best to like a real multimodal treatment not just like trying one thing at a time So long story long, cystoscopy is not, it's not diagnosed with like a potassium test anymore or with a cystoscopy because often the cystoscopies are very normal looking. When we've made the diagnosis, we think, okay, we can't find anything else out. We're just going to call it IC. We didn't see Hunter Hunter ulcers. We didn't see any obvious other source. So we're going to call it IC. So then what? Now we have patients that are having pain, pain with a full bladder. What are our options for treatment? Yeah. So... This is where I think that I start to like treat people maybe a little bit different than like the average because I really am like have such a heightened awareness that many of these patients have endometriosis that I think has been missed to the tune of the fact that I'm doing a randomized control trial right now at Pitt on randomizing people to like usual IC care versus like a bundled approach to IC care, almost like an infectious bundle. I'm doing like an IC bundle for them and I can go through all the parts of the treatment algorithm that are in that bundle. But one of the exclusion criteria for the study is the patient meets, and this is not, there isn't like a distinctive like checklist for endometriosis, but like has symptoms of endometriosis and would presumably meet the criteria to warrant at least a discussion with MIGS and maybe being offered a diagnostic laparoscopy and endo excision. And I cannot tell you how many patients like my partners have sent to be you know, like talked to by the research coordinators to be enrolled in this study. And after talking to them more, you find out that they have like GI symptoms, pain with sex, painful periods, or they had painful periods and they were put on OCPs when they were a teenager. And since then, they've gotten a little better. They have pain in their back or down their legs, like other cyclic symptoms. And I'm like, you know what? Before we go, just like treating your IC, you probably deserve to have a mix consult. And these are the patients that I find like overwhelmingly they have endo when you go in there. But if they they aren't don't fall into that bucket and we enroll them in the study. So I, I do use the AUA guidelines, so I kind of use them all at one time. So I put them on like a whole slew of meds in addition to the behavioral modifications that I mentioned. So for any physician who's listening who doesn't know this, it's like anything that's delicious to drink is probably not good for your IC. So Alcohol, coffee, tea, soda, diet soda, pop, where I come from. Spicy things. I always joke that the worst thing you could probably ever drink would be like a diet spicy margarita would be like the worst drink you could possibly have if you have iced tea. Let's see what else. Acidic things are also terrible. So if you've tried all of that, then I put patients on, I mean, I kind of leave a little bit of this up to them, but I'll put them on some sort of neurogenic med like amitriptyline or gabapentin. I will put them, a lot of them have been on OCPs for a long time and have a little bit of, I think, microbiome dysbiosis going on. I actually put a lot of even young patients on vaginal estrogen, which I think helps them. I put them on peridium, like scheduled peridium, which a lot of people think you can't take peridium for more than three days, but that's not true. You can actually take peridium for quite a long time. I check their creatinine to make sure it's normal, but peridium gets a bad rap and it's honestly the only urinary analgesic that we have. So I put people on that. I put people on Hiprex because there's some pretty good data that methenamine actually is not only prevents UTIs, which a lot of these patients get a lot of UTIs, but it can help with bladder inflammation and bladder healing. I put them on aloe vera tablets like Desert Harvest. I Let's see what else. I offer them bladder installations. I offer them pelvic floor injections. I offer them pelvic floor PT always universally. I offer them... um, When you say pelvic floor injections, where are you injecting? I usually will, depending on what I find on their exam. And what are you injecting? I'm injecting usually a combination of bupivacaine and Kenalog. 
And I'll usually do it in the levators and the pudendal nerves. That's kind of like a standard injection. But a lot of people have obturator spasm or some of them have like kind of piriformis syndrome. It kind of depends what I find on their exam. I don't offer injections to everyone. We do do bladder installations in our practice, like a Whitmore cocktail. For people who don't know what that is, it's basically also a combination of heparin, lidocaine, bicarbonate, that I say Kenalog, a steroid, and plus or minus gentamicin. We don't always put that in there. And there have been some studies that show that the triamcin alone or the catalog is not actually that helpful. Um, Olivia Cardenas Trowers did an RCT on that. So you could take or leave that. And then I sometimes will take them to the OR for an operative cysto to look for a hunter lesion. Sometimes I will even like look before I, I'll end my, my ramble soon. But I find that in a lot of these patients, they have a very inflamed trigone. Their trigone is often extremely red. Um, they have a lot of like sort of squamous metaplasia, which no one exactly really knows what to do with that. But there, I extrapolate sometimes some data from what we do know in like postmenopausal patients with recurrent UTIs who have like a lot of lymphocytic infiltrate that's been identified in some recent papers in their trigone. And sometimes that they have like a lot of that. I'm taking a little bit of a shot in the dark, but I'll like fulgurate that off. It's almost like it's a biofilm or like an inflammatory sort of sediment. Buzzing on top of the trigone? Yeah, like right on right on the trigone. I'll like full, if they have like this squamous endoplasia, all this erythema, it's like something that's bulgaritable. I will give that a go. And I've had some success. Can I ask a dumb question? Yeah. Do guys get IC? Men do get IC, but it's a nine to one ratio. So not nearly as many. And is it is it similar in its presentation? Is it just completely different? Is it like a a great question. I guess you're probably not seeing much of it. A <laughs> urologist. I don't. Just when you think about pathophysiology, I mean, right, we're talking about hormones and we're talking about... Yeah. It just seems like if it's that overwhelmingly found in a female population, there's got to be something going on there. That's what makes me think that the majority of it is actually endometriosis. I know that chronic prostatitis, the, the crosstalk between the afferent nerves between the prostate and the bladder, obviously are very tightly knit same thing with the female pelvis so that's sort of the research that I did when I was a med student was we would literally now I'm going to talk about the colon but we would inflame the colon we'd give basically these rats a sort of chemically induced IBS or really IBD these poor rats they had like terrible diarrhea but then we would take their bladders out like six weeks later and they would have all of these molecular markers of IC. They basically worked as an IC model, but we never touched their bladders. We just like horribly inflamed their colons. And then they would get all of this mast cell recruitment and they'd get all these pain receptor upregulation and they would recruit all these like A delta and C fiber like upregulatory things and the, their bladders would have these like sort of all these other markers of IC. We'd even put them in these little wells and like see how often they contracted and we'd measure how much, how often these rats urinated and like Anyway, they basically all got IC from having a viscous organ with inflammation nearby. And a very similar thing happens in like a rat model of endometriosis or like a rat model of prostatitis. They end up with a lot of really inflamed urinary things. But that's kind of how I explain it to my patients too when I talk to them. I'm like, you know, endometriosis, IC, IBS, these are three chronic pelvic inflammatory conditions of unknown etiology. Like, you know, and, and, and I think we know that when you have IBS or IC and you treat their endometriosis a lot with birth control pills or norethadrone, oftentimes their IC and their IBS can get better. You know, is it just because there's less, like the inflammation's not pissing off the neighbors as much? Is there truly a hormonal component to it? Again, but like we know it's related and and it can't just simply be, again, with endometriosis, and it's not just the lesions. It's not just those little nodules. It's so much more. And that's where the surgical approach to endometriosis to me, it just never... I mean, obviously, there's a role for surgery, but as a primary tool for managing endometriosis, it's like it's there's cells every it's everywhere. You can't complete excision. Like it's not a thing. It can't be. There's no way. Can I just ask about the I've ne- I've heard of the somatic referred pain, but I've never heard of this visceral referred pain and this crosstalk. Like, how does it work? Does it go to the ganglia? Like, I want to get into this thing because dumb it down for the listeners. Like I know like me. me. <laughs> But like I've heard Susie's talk about central sensitization essentially, but I didn't realize, and I know that they run together in terms of the IC, I- IBS, vulvodynia, all these disorders, but 
Like, how does it not affect the rest of your body? Does it just go into your pelvic nerves and the ganglia there or? That's exactly what happens. So like another experiment that I spent a very meticulous, this is how I knew I was like not built to be like a lab researcher was when I was in med school. Again, like my two mentors, I mean, Pam Wally was sort of one of my great mentors. She's a very famous urogynecologist for anyone who's listening and currently my boss. But I did research with a gastroenterologist and a urologist in order to study female pelvic pain. So we would inject these like radio fluorescent markers into the colon. It was blue. I remember it was like a blue luminescent dye and it would get taken up by the afferent nerves in the colon. And then we would inject yellow dye into the bladder. And then we would this was so insane, like this dissection we would do to get out the dorsal root ganglia of the lumbosacral nerve roots of these rats. It was so small. And then slice them up and then look at them and look and see where the dye tracker had gone. And we would find that like a really large number of these dorsal root gang- ganglion like neuron roots had both blue and yellow dye in them. Like they synapsed literally on the same exact nerve root. And then they would look and see like, is now like this message from the colon, like this inflammation that's telling like all the afferent nerves in the colon, like, hey, we're on fire, help us. (laughs) It would go like back to the spinal cord and then it would, in these shared neurons, like send out this like inflammatory signal that would affect the neighboring organs that shared the same nerve supply. And then those nerve endings, when they, we would also do like all these histologic slices of it, would recruit all these mast cells like to the nerve endings specifically that had like the crosstalk happening. So like the nerves that are shared with the other angry organ like summon all this like it puts out all this like TNF alpha and all these mast cells and just like brings all this angry inflammation like to its little endings. And then it starts to upregulate all this other all this other these all these other signaling pathways that makes your bladder very like overactive and painful and kicks and like makes the urethelium very leaky because the mast cells are like releasing all these tryptases and they're making all like the junctional proteins like go to crap and then all of a sudden the bladder is a mess and in tatters and it's very susceptible to like other irritants you know like when it fills but also like from its sort of lamina propria side like it's just has all these mast cells in it now and they're going crazy and the, all of the interferents that feel pain, like A delta and C fibers, get really upregulated. So I find that fascinating because it's really not part of our, like what is taught in medical schools. Like we all hear about referred pain and the diaphragmatic irritation, for, you know, causing shoulder pain and those kind of things. But like we don't hear about the visceral aspects of the autonomic fibers, which I find fascinating. It's so interesting. I can't even explain it well. That it's not well understood? Is it that it's new? Is it that, like, no one cares, all the above? I think that it actually is understood, like, fairly well. I did this research, like, over a decade ago and worked with all these really brilliant people who were like, oh, yeah, this is a thing. Like, it's a pretty well-known mechanism of, like, visceral hyperalgesia and and crosstalk. Like, there are lots of, there's a few different mechanisms for it, but it's, like, a pretty well-established thing I think it's just that no one knows how to reverse it. Like once the horse has left the barn, like how do you downregulate these mast cells? How do you downregulate all these pain receptors that have suddenly come to the surface? Like how do you reverse central sensitization? I don't think we know how to do that because that is also so closely tied to like the emotional stress that like has been triggered in real people who experience these symptoms. So what starts out maybe as like an infection or maybe an autoimmune condition or maybe like another disease in another organ. Suddenly you have these real world symptoms, you have distress over it, which probably kicks up your cortisol or who knows what else. And then all of a sudden, like your whole body is programmed to feel pain. And it's like, how do you put that horse back in the barn? That's why, you know, they try drugs like Lyrica and like all this other stuff, but it becomes like a full body disease. Endometriosis, when it's a painful disease, is not just like a gynecologist disease. It is like a full body, a full body thing. And I think that's why we've just not been very successful at treating it. Well, I mean, it's frustrating when I hear from um, our MIG surgeons that some oncologists are teaching the residents like endometriosis isn't a real disease or I mean, it just sounds. And But I, I mean, at McGee, I know when I trained, the oncologists definitely respected and 
hated endometriosis because they're hard cases. You know, they're wor- they're like ovarian cancer cases. Except endo doesn't respect surgical planes. It's like it's a lot of those safe spaces are no longer safe spaces in surgery. But the other big thing for me is, you know, talking about oncologists taking care of endo is like, it's not the surgery, right? That's not the only piece of it. It's the hours and hours in clinic before and the education and understanding and the medical management and pre and preparing for the post-op medical management and the number of patients I see that have endo that are you know, the ovaries left behind and they weren't suppressed at all afterwards or there's no discussion of post-op management. It's kind of like once once the surgery's done, I'm kind of, you know, I've, I've ended my management. And with endometriosis, that's not how it's managed. It's like not following a cancer patient afterwards. Yeah. I'm like, you have to go get PT. You need to have like chronic pain management. Like, yeah, well, this is one piece of it, but this is like a lifelong disease. It is like a cancer that doesn't kill you. You still need like multidisciplinary care to manage it afterwards. Yeah, that makes me crazy. What do you say about the people who are excision only? Because there's a lot of those people out there. Careful. How many comments on social media do you want to get for... uh... (laughs) I mean, some people are passionate about it. I, I say that jokingly, but like, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? I mean... I am not, even though I was trained as a MIG surgeon at MedSir, I don't currently excise, you know, so it's so I don't want to be like, oh, it's so easy to do just excise. Like you have to be a really talented surgeon with a lot of training to excise endometriosis because as you said, those pelvises are a hot mess. You could be in there for an hour. You could be in there for eight hours. I think I do subscribe to like, well, I mean, I guess let me be clear about what you're asking, but I think that if somebody is going into a pelvis looking for endometriosis, they better have the surgical skills to completely excise it. I do think that complete excision is the surgical gold standard, but I do believe that it is just a piece of the treatment of endometriosis and that we do overhype it in terms of how much pain relief specifically a patient can expect from complete excision. But what do you mean by complete excision? That's a great question, too. I don't know if we've even defined that. But you're not taking everything out unless you're taking the peritoneal services of every organ in the belly, then you're not completely excising anything. Right. I'm sure there's microscopic endo. Of course. Of course. Or visible lesions, I guess. Again, cirrhosal layers on the uterus. I mean, again, there's, you know, you you take out the ovarian fossa, you're taking out this, you know, bladder, peritoneum, but there's, but there are areas that you're leaving behind. So again, and and we don't even know what causes it. So why wouldn't it recur? And things like, you know, guys like Frank, too, have talked about, like, we're not even thinking about the new nerve growth and as reperitonealization occurs. So all the damage that's been done to take those lesions out, there's like no literature on how regrowth of the of the peritoneal lining and the, and the nerve regrowth and how that impacts the future anyway. So it is more than that. And it, yes, excision is important. And if you have a focal lesion and nodules, those things for sure, and they are hard cases, but I just don't think that's it, right? I think it w- with what you're saying. No chance that's all it. I had a convers- a long conversation the other day with an oncol- like a cancer oncologist, like a basic scientist, who they were like, I feel like if you put a team of cancer researchers on endometriosis, they could figure it out in like six months. Like that's probably, I mean, he, not to be like, you know, he wasn't saying that to be pompous. He was just like, it's appalling that no one has like taken the tools that we have in oncology and applied them to this disease yet. Like what is stopping people from doing that? And he's, he's not wrong. He's like, there's so many things that so many ways we know to study like how cancer cells move and do things and find their targets that has never been done in this disease. It did take a century though, for people to, to think of cancer more than just a surgical disease too, though. I mean, that's the other thing is it's a lot's happening now. Very little happened for the prior century with cancer care. And so I think there's a good opportunity for that for sure. But so we talked about MIGS a lot, but I want to talk about your multidisciplinary clinic because I do think that's something that is tough to do in some ways. We've done that a little bit where I am in, in different spaces. And when they work, man, is it fun, but they can be tough. So tell me about what you're doing in Pittsburgh. Yeah. So we actually had this clinic today. It, the endometriosis center at Pitt was already established when I showed up being run by MIGS and they were seeing patients alongside pelvic floor PT at the same time, plus or minus behavioral health, a psych piece. But I'm obviously very passionate about adding my sort of urogyne expertise and bladder pain expertise. And so I really wanted to be involved 
And so I, with the help of Nicole Danellen, who you should probably have come on here because she's brilliant and awesome, I said, can I be a part of the Endo Center as a Euroguide? And she was super excited. She is a real mentor and sponsor to me. And she said, you can like take it away. I'll support you however you want. And so we basically were like, okay, where clinically are we seeing patients that we also have physical therapy that we can find, carve out a time where we can all be there together? And it's actually very cool. Uh, UPMC has a sports medicine center that also has OBGYN built in. It's called the Lemieux Center after Mario Lemieux. It's also the Penn's practice facility. It's a kind of a really interesting clinic that has an ice rink in the middle of it and like PT right across the hall from OBGYN. And then, you know, the ortho offices are downstairs. So anyway, twice a month, there's we split the clinic in half. There's Dr. Janellen's template is in the morning. My template is in the afternoon. And in the morning, I kind of have like administrative time, but any patients that would benefit from me seeing them for a consult for their bladder or for like pelvic floor trigger point injections, I will go in and see that patient after she has seen them alongside of pelvic floor physical therapy. They see the patient together. And if the patient wants to get physical therapy that day without having to have multiple exams, And we all sort of have a discussion about the patient. They go across the hall to the physical therapy offices and they have physical therapy right then and there. Sometimes I will even do like pelvic floor trigger point injections and then they'll go get PT immediately after their injection, which a really interesting paper came out last year showing that patients actually do have an improved response to PT if they have injections sort of right beforehand. Before each visit. Not each visit, but depending on the patient, if there's someone who just like is not tolerating PT really well, I don't know, their pain is in a really specific area. We work with PT. PT often will see the patient first and then say, I think this would be somebody that would respond really well to an injection before their visit. Or if you could do injections first and then send them back to us instead of the other way around, I leave that to the PT's judgment. They're really good and they know when someone is not just going to cold turkey be able to handle physical therapy like day one. It's such an important part of it to be able to have PT, to have that relationship. And I'm very lucky that our PTs are downstairs from where we are. I was sort of part of bringing pelvic floor PT to UK because it was such a big deal at Michigan when I trained in. It was something that, I mean, people were using it. I'm not, it wasn't like I brought it, but it was something that I was part of building it where it was because there was so much demand, but they're right downstairs and they, the letters they write and we can communicate and managing patients together is, is wonderful. So it's all, it's amazing. You've got them across the hall though. And like in the same visit. Yeah. Same visit. It's awesome. And then in the middle of the day at lunch, we have like a multidisciplinary meeting with behavioral health about patients that in particular need like extra. It's almost sort of like a tumor board where we all sort of part virtual part in person we had it today and talk about some like really challenging patients so that has been really great and i think one of there's still pieces that we're trying to add we're sort of trying to recruit a gi person that's a whole other podcast like how little training gi gets in gynecology and like female pelvic medicine but we we interviewed and are really trying to recruit someone who's interested in doing that from a gi perspective GI, colorectal surgery, both? Are you looking like... Mostly GI, colorectal. I don't really know like how much of a... I mean, for really bad endo lesions maybe, but I really think like on the medical side, you really need a good GI person who knows a lot about motility, understands like how IBS and endometriosis interact, understand defecatory disorders and pelvic floor spasm, like puborectalis spasm, dysenergic defecation, that kind of thing. That's really helpful. We work... They, they're not in the clinic, but we do have people from like pain medicine, like also some internal medicine people who are super closely with PM&R. I have an emergency medicine doc who helps me make complex care plans for these patients, very similar to as if they were a sickle cell patient. We have regular sort of meetings where we talk about like when they come to the ER with a flare, like what are we giving them that a chronic pain specialist helps in those meetings as well, like come up with those plans. So we have a lot of friends like in the pot. We're still working on it, but that's kind of what I spend my time doing in that clinic is like coordinating that kind of care for these patients who have a lot of like medical PTSD from just not being believed and going from doctor to doctor to doctor who aren't talking to each other. I sort of, my role is to talk to them all for them. So I write a lot of notes and messages and emails, but I think it helps. It's incredible. I mean, 
you know, it's not an easy thing. Having people buy into what you're doing is, I think, my favorite part of this job is like getting people who are equally excited as you are trying to solve complicated problems. And being in a university seems to attract some of those, some of us who like solving hard problems, like doing hard puzzles. But finding other colleagues, I mean, I've got a colorectal surgery colleague who I do all my tough endo cases with, and it's just like my favorite days. And that, you know, in my fiber program we built in the IR docs, just like catching up and imaging is a whole other thing. I don't know if you guys do much with that with radiology, but we've been very lucky too to do that. And so ha- just having these partners solving these hard problems, but what it can do for patients to have that buy-in. So I plea for docs out there with, with skills and ability to like reach out and think about how you can contribute to women's health and these complex diseases that, that need more more time, more energy, more effort outside of your own little wheelhouse. And, and it's been, that's where I've had the most fun and had the most success, I think. So so kudos to you and your, and your group over there. Oh, thank you. No, I really think those colorectal surgeons, all these specialists, I always tell them, I'm like, this is an area, do you want to become like famous in your field? Go back to your meetings with your colleagues and like talk about how you manage this. There is no nothing in the GI literature about how to manage IBS caused by endometriosis. That is not a thing in their IBS guidelines, but it's probably like the majority of IBS in women is probably related to endo in some way or like some huge piece of it. And they don't even think about it. It doesn't even cross their mind when I tell them their mind is blown. So that is like, I'm like, you could become really famous really fast in your field for basically like writing guidelines that don't exist. And the last thing I want to say is people who care, I don't want to um, undersell how important it has been to have administrators in our department who care deeply about women's health, people who have literally like masters in healthcare administration. We have most of our administrators are, are women and they went into healthcare administration to help do women's health from that angle. And that is one of the most powerful things I've ever witnessed because we go into their office and say, like, this is a population of patients who are suffering and they're falling between the cracks. Like, we need you to help us set up pathways between psych, between the ER, between GI. And they work on those things behind the scenes so that we can actually, like, have resources and be profitable. Like, it's been shown in studies that you can generate, like, a lot of new business for your healthcare system if you have these clinics set up. So they have a lot of buy-in with us too. And they they phone in actually to our multidisciplinary meetings as administrators to see how they can support the clinic. So that is the the reason the clinic exists is because they are so devoted. It sounds like you've got a great team there. I mean, it sounds like you've got great support. And I think that's, it is tough when you don't have that. It is tough to understand all the different people it takes to put together. But, you know, I think, because, you know, I know that Nicole and I were fellows at the same time. I've known her for a long time, and yeah, she's absolutely incredible. And I, I wonder what I was thinking, but leaving a place like Michigan to go to Kentucky and start something, it really does, it all starts with that one that one partner, that one nurse, who's like, all right, I'll do it with you. You, really? Okay, uh, let's do it. And then people see how much fun you're having and see the cool things you're doing, and then they want to join in. And it really is just be excited and be nice and find partners and give them a chance to do something, you know, find people who are excited about the same things you are. And now, if you know, and those things can build. So as much as I look at places like Pitt, I'm just like, okay, I don't even know where to begin. It does oftentimes just take that one person, that one partner who can help you work towards that. And, you know, they had their thing, but you coming in brought a whole new angle to it with the Eurogyne perspective on, on what they were doing. And so each having that small program each time you find one new person to bring in brings it elevates it to that next thing so it's fun to watch and it's it's inspiring for those of us who are still uh, continuing to build where we are so all right so your clinic is trying to rethink ic management endo and all that but what we've talked a little bit about this but what's the future like what what don't what are the exciting research discoveries on the horizon that you think like this is where we're headed and this is where the answer lies? I think a lot of what we've talked about already, like the recognition of other inflammatory disorders, especially in women and how they affect end organs like the bladder. I think that's getting a lot of recognition. Autoimmune. Autoimmune. Infectious. Infectious. I think that honestly, like covid research and and like long covid the things we're learning about about the mechanisms of that i think are going to be helpful for unraveling 
I see. Like, how does an infectious insult lead to all this dysregulation? I don't know if you see patients, but I see a lot of patients with like mast cell activation syndrome, like MCAS, and they have and POTS. Like, that community is very, very vocal on social media. That's part of the reason I like being on social media, trying to figure out what's going on, like in the patient community. COVID has unmasked a lot of POTS and MCAS in patients. And these are patients who are routinely being dismissed in the ERs. They tend to also sort of overlap with this like IC endo population. So I think we're going to learn a lot more about mast cells in particular and how from COVID and how that might relate to like other biological processes. I think that is one thing that's sort of interesting and happening. COVID is a total inflammatory totally disease. 100%. One hundred percent, like a multi-organ inflammatory disease. So correct, and so is endometriosis. So, so it's interesting that you say that. Like, does it unmask it, or is it the etiology? Like, I feel like who knows. But there's a lot. I think we're going to learn about inflammation from COVID and long COVID syndromes that is going to help us with with IC and with endo. So maybe that's not, not certainly not a blessing. But if there's any silver lining. That might be like it spurned a lot of basic science that maybe could be applied. And then there's some other like therapeutics that I think are pretty interesting. There's a lot of talk about like PRP injections for IC that have shown some promise. I've read a a few um, good papers that I think were done in China that showed that PRP was sort of helpful. These sort of like immune, again, like powerful anti-inflammatory things. There's still a lot we don't know that might be very interesting. There's some interesting studies on cannabis. That's more for endo on the endo side, but that like cannabis actually has been shown in rats to like regress endo lesions and they've actually gotten smaller through various like cannabinoid pathways. So there's just a lot of like interesting things that I think if we could just get a little more funding, a little more interest. I hope anyone who's listening, any med students, PhD students that are looking for a basic science route, there's a lot to do. Well, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate your time. You're clearly very, very busy. And so you talked about your journey, all the folks you met along the way that have just sort of built with each step from your birth in labor and delivery where you work, all the way through your mentors through undergrad and and beyond to help build this career you've had for yourself, which is so impressive at such an early part of your career. I mean, that's the other thing is like, we're talking about where the future of endo and IC and those things is where that's coming from. And I feel like I'm looking at it right now. So at least at least a piece of it. I, I, it's, well, it ain't coming from me. So I'm, I'm glad people like you are working on it and advocating and, and recruiting others, not just here today, but in your everyday with your social media and how active you are and really speaking out about these things that need we need to shine a greater light on these things and, 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 and turn up the volume. So more people like you who are talented and hardworking and brilliant and focused on solving these complex problems, you know, I think that's, you're doing all the things. And so I, I know your patients are grateful. I'm very grateful that you're you're doing such good work and that you made time for our little show. Not a little show. It's a very popular show. I'm very honored that you had me. You're both awesome. Dr. Park is awesome. She's my inspiration for being on social media. I tell people all the time, it's not every day that you're a fellow And you have attendings that are like encouraging you to talk on social media. A lot of people, a lot of times it's the opposite. So I give her all the credit for making me feel brave. Actually, I just laugh because Sherelle inspired me. I was so skeptical. And then I just distinctly remember Jocelyn was my fellow and I were trying to crack into the top 10 SGS influencers. (laughs) And like, like Jocelyn was like, my fingers hurt. I was trying so hard. Did he get carpal tunnel syndrome? <laughs> I mean, like, Both of us were like, like tweeting. sore thumbs. Yeah, sore thumbs. The syndrome they have it in Korea, I guess. It's like you Nintendo know, and, thumb, like, we used to call it as kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Laugh. I, I, I think about that all the time. And then Jocelyn had this viral tweet, and then she all of a sudden got like 25,000 followers. <laughs> were you like mad? Were you like furious that she did better than you, Amy? That she was like, that? <laughs> no, I'm happy get- for her. No, I like it. A rising tide lifts all ships or whatever, you know? But yeah, no, no. I mean, like, I always like, you know, like her tweets, and she likes mine, and it's like totally... Listen, I this is this is not a contest about followers. We The more OBGYNs on social media, the better. Yeah. And also, I have more of a physician facing 
profile and Jocelyn has more of a patient facing, like public facing profile. So in terms of content, I mean, mine is open, obviously, but yeah, no, I, and then now it's all moved to TikTok. Yeah. Can't do it. Pretty Can't hard. Do TikTok. I'm barely still on Twitter right now with all the nonsense, but it's hobbling along. I know. I know. I know. But it is how I met a lot of people and how I got to become friends with a lot of people in our field. And so I'm very grateful for the social media part. I'm not as active. My thumbs are not as toned <laughs> as the two of you. You guys have great looking thumbs. Um, wow, thanks. <laughs> from, from, all, from all your tweeting. Um, we'll do a thumb war at SGS. <laughs> I, w- I wouldn't dare challenge you. I know better. But it is work. And that's something I think I've learned from a lot of you guys about social media and the value and the power of reaching I think about being like, being a celebrity or an athlete now or before there was always this mysterious sort of like cloak. And now like everybody has like direct access. You can just message somebody like almost directly. It's mind blowing to think about that. And as physicians to have a reach that is beyond your clinic. And that's something that I think is pretty revolutionary. And a lot of people are looking for answers. And so when folks like you are out there doing it, I know it means a lot. So on just like this show, it's the, the wide international reach that we have is is only just beginning but i think in the spirit of trying to educate and try to solve these hard problems uh, we appreciate all you're doing and we really appreciate you coming on the show thank you jocelyn again thank you for having me it was so fun and thank you for giving up your evening to do this thank you so much for listening if you haven't already make sure to follow the podcast rate it five stars and share with a friend if you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable OBGYN on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable OBGYN is hosted by myself, Mark Hoffman. And Amy Park. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from Taylor's version Hess and Yvonne Ovijinski. Show notes and social media by Emma Landonwich and Lindsay Beecham. Administrative support provided by Jim Louis Kinnebrew. Music written and performed by Scott Baby Daddy Hoffman. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on Backtable OBGYN are their own and do not reflect the views or positions of their employers or any entities they represent.